I'm an associate professor in ecology now, um, but basically went through the school system in New South Wales and was always interested in animals and, you know, I think for a long time wanted to be a vet, but it wasn't until I went to uni, went to Sydney Uni and really got interested in the conservation and, and wildlife aspect of research and science and, and um, have really progressed from there. I don't think there was any particular moment. I've always grown up around animals and having animals. I'd have to say that probably, uh, you know, like most wildlife biologists, David Attenborough, and probably a lot of the, uh, uh, the even the Australian sort of pioneers in that field um, really influenced me in the, in the beginning, those sort of TV uh, uh, sort of shows and those sort of things like that. So look, I think everything I do is, has, I guess, for, from the formal training of the scientific method and that sort of thing, that underpins everything. But I suspect, I guess, really as a scientist now, we have to be a lot more vocal. We actually, you know, there's almost a war on science in, over you know, uh, in, so the political, the economic, and the scientific inquiry is, to, is really to better humanity, but also better the world. So we, we've seen large progresses of in, uh, um, I guess we're much better off, but that's come potentially at the cost of the environment. And to make the world better, I think we're, it needs champions around the environment too. And that's kind of where I sort of want to fit in. Yeah, so I've got a major project really looking at the impact of, of foxes, but a whole range of human related activities on freshwater turtles. So we're seeing a massive decline of freshwater turtles throughout most of Australia. Um, so it's a combination of factors uh, that really has, has driving them to extinction. They're really long lived species uh, and you know, live up to 100 years or so. So we actually don't see declines for quite a long time, but if we don't do something about it now, you know, it'll be too late into the future. I guess we really started back uh, when I first started doing research as an honour student at Sydney Uni. We saw uh, significant numbers of nests being destroyed by foxes. Uh, just being out in the field, walking around paddocks, walking around parks, with lots of eggshells. And it really started all off, is that if we're not getting little juvenile turtles into the population, are we, you know, do we have a problem? So really it's been up until this point actually quantifying what are the impacts, what are the actual impacts on, on freshwater turtles. And we know that foxes are a major, a major influence, but what we are now starting to see, you know, from that time, 20 years ago, things like wildlife diseases, things like road mortality, which we didn't really expect uh, at the time, and this has really sort of evolved. And we're now at the critical point of working out what's the best solution, how do we actually mitigate these, these issues, and the science is really, you know, understanding the problem and is it having an impact, and that's where we've led to. We know it's having an impact and we know, we can almost predict when freshwater turtles will go extinct, and we're starting to see that now in South Australia because of a whole suite of combination, not just foxes, but water quality down in South Australia is an, is an issue. Wildlife diseases, we're seeing turtle diseases down there, and we're basically seeing populations being wiped out. So now's the point where we actually turn the ecological evidence that we have into conservation and actually you know, work out the best management plans, and that's where we're at that critical stage now. I guess a lot of this is human-induced. We introduce foxes. We've you know, particularly in the Murray River, we've made such large changes that we've affected uh, the water quality, we've affected a whole range, we've put roads around uh, most of our major rivers. So we're seeing our animals and our turtles, in this case, actually being impacted by the foxes, by the roads, by the water quality. So what we've really tried to understand is what's the relative impact of, of those and on what life stages and then how do we actually now, now that we know a lot about the turtles and where they're being impacted, how do we actually stop or um, compensate for uh, uh, those impacts? Look, it all started with uh, an observation and probably uh, an observation from uh, an initial report from my PhD supervisor at the time about high levels of, of, of fox predation on, on nests. So you could just walk around. A lot of people, if you're on, on a farm or if you've got a dam and that sort of thing, you walk around and you find eggshells. That's, that's a turtle nest that, that there. So it's really easy to actually identify and actually think, well, there's, you know, you know, there's one patch we walked around and counted about 100 nests. 
dug up and you're kind of thinking well th this could actually be a problem so the next step is really to actually and that was in my PhD to actually experimentally test and see. So we had some areas where we removed foxes, some areas where we kept foxes and actually looked at nest predation rates uh, with and without foxes and found that pretty much foxes account for around about 90, 90% to 90 uh, or more nest predation rate uh, uh, where you had foxes. So that then led to the next stage is that, well, can turtles actually handle 90% plus nest predation rate? So it's not yeah, they live a long time, so maybe they can handle that type of thing. So that's where we went into, you know, the initial stages. Because they're such long-lived animals, you're not going to see a decline uh, for a long time using models and that sort of thing to actually say, can they handle high mortality at this life history stage, you know, uh, um, at, versus other life history stages as well. So while we're out there doing the research and actually being in, in the field investigating the impact of foxes, we started to see much broader impacts. Things like road mortality, just driving along the roads, we started seeing turtles being squished on the roads and think, hang on, if this, this is occurring here and it's potentially occurring at you know, all wetlands, we then needed to actually work out, well, what, what are those impacts? And particularly, we, like I said, doing some of the modelling, we realised that impacts on adult turtles has far greater greater influence on the population sizes than what something like nest predation does. So even one turtle being killed on the roads, if you think about it, um, she might be 10, 15 years old, she might live to 100, produce 20 eggs a year, there's a lot of reproductive potential. So then we started looking at those issues. We had a mass uh, mortality event down in South Australia where the water quality during the last drought be turned fresh water into hypersaline and all these marine uh, pest uh, tube worms uh, potentially killed a lot of tens of thousands of turtles. Um, adult turtles, they basically grew almost like coral on the back of the turtles, that, that these are freshwater turtles. So we then realised that potentially these other factors, you have this undercurrent of, of high nest predation, no juvenile recruitment, but then you have these mortality events on the adults, really leads to a bad situation that we need to, need to start addressing and look, looking at that and quantifying it. Firstly, we need to, at least in a local area, actually understand how many uh, animals, say, were being killed on roads. And that was just doing regular road patrols and working out how many per year. We actually understood, you know, when turtles were most, uh, most at risk during nesting season, and we actually could quantify that. What we've done over the last five years, though, is actually to see how widespread this problem is, we've actually implemented citizen science. This is another tool now that we can actually use you know, as a single researcher or even just a few, with a few, you know, a, a, a lab with a few PhD students, we really can't do, you know, broad areas. We can, we can do small areas very well, but to actually understand the, the, the impact of it, we uh, implemented citizen science, really got people involved to report. One of the best things about turtles is everyone knows what a turtle looks like. It's very distinct to a rat or a, or a kangaroo. So when people see them, they're usually on roads and so they are at risk so we can actually start uh, and people can easily record it so we just use modern technology using app, app technology people can record uh, that the most important thing there is that as a scientist we need to do that properly it is a tool citizen science is a tool to actually collect proper data, good data. So it was really important that we had the me methodologies developed properly. So with the citizen science data that we've collected is uh, a lot of it is location based. So we actually need to look at tools that can identify hotspots, identify hotspots where they're being killed, where the turtles are crossing roads. Um, and we're using things like GIS technology, using kernel density um, statistics to actually identify where in the country, this is you know throughout the country, particularly southern and southeastern Australia, where are these hotspots and what what can we actually do? Particularly with this technology, you can actually uh, bring in other databases. Are they related to the types of roads, uh, distance to wetlands, those sort of things? And we can actually make really good pro potential predictions about other areas. There's particular landscape type modelling where you can use GIS type type. Uh, uh, 
databases and statistics that within that. But for the populations, particularly with long-lived species that I work on, using population modelling, things like stage-based projection matrices, which are really, really important because to look at population trends in something that lives 100 years, you know, compared to, you know, Drosophila or flies that, you know, have generations over, you know, over a month, we're probably going to be long gone before we actually can, can understand those trends. So the population modelling actually really gives us an insight. Obviously you have to have good data going in, you know, for the different, you know, understanding survival rates, you know, understanding where is the mortality, where is that occurring and actually understanding what is the life history cycle of a turtle, which is pretty simple. They live in the water, they grow, they take about 10 years to mature, then they'll come out and drop eggs in on the ground for 100 years, they do that every year. Easy life, life history cycle. We can then apply pretty standard population matrices to make predictions to try and understand what will happen into the future. And I like to see these models as, as a way for hypothesis testing, to actually say, look, this is what we've got, these are our observations, this is what we're projecting and what we think will happen, and obviously understanding where the impacts are occurring at those life history stages, and actually monitoring those is really, really it can really drive management in that, in that case. Obviously we've done experiments to actually say with and without predators, so we know what the uh, predation rates are with foxes, without foxes, so you can actually create these two parallel models to actually say what trajectories are the populations going on. But even within the models you can create scenarios. So you can actually create, say all right, we've had a hundred years of, of fox predation, probably since they a bit, bit over a hundred years since they were introduced. What happens if we start impacting them now and where? Obviously on the landscape too. We can't obviously get at this stage remove all foxes, but we can actually impact certain areas and so we can then bring in not just the population but also the landscape level aspects to say if we reduce foxes in this population so we put fences up or we you know do removal or we find alternate techniques what impact is that going to have on you know the whole region in terms of more hatchlings you know spreading throughout the region and those sort of things they're the kind of predictions that we're sort of getting to and they're the kind of predictions that we are now looking to Im and starting to implement on a landscape level to actually say, right, can we create source populations? Are these, these are the ones we target all our, there's only a certain amount of money that, and resources that go around, can we target the important populations and, and head down that road? And that's all because of data that we've generated and then put into population models to make predictions. Communication is, has certainly evolved. We actually have to now be advocates so as scientists pre previously, I mean there's still part of that whole scientific process is to go through and produce a manuscript, as in you know, taking it from an idea to a scientific report that is judged by your peers, by, by other scientists. And that's produced in a, a, a published in a uh, scientific journal. It doesn't stop there, it used to stop there, like as in produced in scientific, you know, your job's done. But we actually now have to, as scientists, be advocates and actually if this is, a, this is an important paper for management, actually take it down that path. Work with councils, work with uh, the government agencies and that, that sort of thing to actually interpret and actually say this is how you should do things on the ground. Not just produce a scientific publication, go and read it and make it up yourself. Um, and social media certainly is a, a, a way that we need to promote, that we promote our, our work um, these days too because there are so many different networks from the general public to government agencies to uh, uh, other researchers that we, we uh, connect with through social media. I think the fundamental process of science will never change. Like that scientific methodology that I guess the way inquiry method really um, has evolved in different ways and that, that sort of thing, but basically the fundamentals are still the same. Really what we're talking about is Really, scientists almost becoming politicians, or heading that way, and we need probably more scientists as politicians in, in there. I don't think scientists have really thought about doing that in, in, in the past, as really just go and do, but it's, beyond, it's now beyond that, that the scientific community, just like any other part of the public, um, is, is, is a member of, of the community and actually, I think, 
you know, our politicians, we, we actually need to be representative there, uh, re have represent, representation there in, 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 in politics. I'd say the first thing is follow your passion, even though you don't know what your career path might be, but follow your passion. And if science is your passion, jump into citizen science now. There are so many projects out there uh, that have re generate real meaningful data that you can be involved with and, and be, be part, part of and find your passion and potentially find your passion there. Um, it's a start. Most citizen science projects will actually see that, that you will have scientists behind it, backing it, then you'll actually have management agencies or depending on where, uh, which are government actually promoting and, and, and generating it. It's actually your start to path to networking as well. So it's not just about you know going out collecting data, seeing a turtle on the road and recording it. You can actually get involved and actually be uh, connected with the scientists and leads to a whole suite of other opportunities. Go out you know doing lots of volunteer opportunities and those sort of things. But that's probably a good starting point. And also contact you know, if you're reading stuff. If you're reading stuff, and you're picking up you know, uh, scientific journals and you see the name and they've got email addresses as contacts, contact them, absolutely. There's lots of opportunities to uh, come and do some volunteer work or go on field trips and, and, and that, that sort of thing as well. So certainly search the university. The, most universities have very, very bad websites, but at least there's names and, and may have, you know, what they actually do and you can contact them that way. Or certainly, you know, start reading the scientific literature and it has contact details there and start contacting people from it as well. But citizen science is a great way, great entry point.